Good afternoon. We're here with Greg Perry, curator, Shivers Museum Library. And our discussion today will be about Benjamin Franklin's Junto Club and how it relates to the Library Company of Philadelphia. So Greg, when uh, Franklin arrived in Philadelphia, what kind of institutions did he find? Well, he found it uh, quite the, the dearth of any institutions, uh, no libraries. Um, he, he found a barren, uh, illiterate area. And uh, it, it inspired him, the printer coming in, you know, in the uh, early 1700s. He came as a printer's apprentice, but uh, he felt the need to try to develop uh, non-governmental institutions and uh, some type of learning that the people of Philadelphia could flourish, hence the, the colonies in the country, future country would start to flourish. And what type of educational opportunities existed? Uh, no adult education, uh, unfortunately no libraries. There were uh, three libraries in Philadelphia, you know, around 1731, um, belonging only to white men, white men with a lot of money, a lot of power. And unfortunately, when you have white men with a lot of power, you have uh, suppression of the, the rest of the, uh, the electorate, so to speak, or the rest of the population. So, and uh, quite in fact, they would not lend any of the books out. Franklin tried on occasion to lend them out to some of himself and some of his cohorts, and they had nothing to do with it. So uh, education is power, books are knowledge. They want to keep it all for themselves. And could you explain the type of society of increased learning that Franklin set up? Um, Franklin had an idea of setting up a, uh, because Franklin came from the, quote, leather apron class. He was a, a craftsman. Um, so he wanted to set up, uh, he wanted to help enlighten other craftsmen, similar cabinet makers, shoemakers, blacksmiths, and the like. Uh, so what he wanted to do was he wanted to educate them. Here, these people were very skilled and dexterity speaking, but they were very ignorant. And he wanted, if he felt he could open their world up um, as being one of his own through the, uh, through the power of books, it would help them uh, you know, with motivation, with, with courage, with talking to clients, with uh, just presenting themselves better with the public. They can make a better living. So this was his first initial goal, was to uh, set a little group up and, uh, and kind of an experiment. And they called it the Junto Club. And you, t you touched on uh, some of the goals of his organization. Uh, can you expound on that? Well, I think the, the goals of Franklin's early Junto was uh, increase your knowledge and help, help your community, help do things positive in your community. Every day, do something positive. And move yourself up a different rung in the ladder of your community. Don't sit at the same, don't sit at the bottom because you were uh, a craftsman, an artisan. Um, you, you deserve more than this. You're, you're here to help build this city, this colony, this nation. Excellent. And, and where did they meet, and what was the frequency of the meetings of this organization? Well, the, the Junto started meeting um, in the city tavern. They would have meetings uh, essentially or basically every Friday night or one of the members' homes. Generally speaking, it was only 12, 10 to 12 members who would fluctuate. And uh, what they, what Franklin asked them, anyone who would have books to bring the books. And unfortunately, uh, you know, being in, in this type of class, one, one individual had two books, another had 10 books. So this was the variety and the quantity of books they had. Not all the books were good. I mean, one, one of the books would have been how to speak successful English, British English. So what they would do, they would put these books at the city tavern in a bookcase and they came up with the idea, or Franklin came up with a set of rules that um, if anyone needed a book, they could borrow a book. Uh, they had to bring it back in a set period of time. Um, so their motto became, you know, knowledge is power and it's achieved through books, through reading. So at times they would actually get meet at uh, one of the members' houses, not necessarily the city tavern, all the time. And so after a, a few years, what kind of results were produced by this organization? Well, I think as, as a lot of civic-minded uh, inventions, it kicked off rather well, and there was a multitude of people that would like to join, not just 12. There was just a plethora of individuals that would like to join the group. But I think Franklin was dealing with an experiment here, as, as he would in later life. He wanted to see how this small group would fare, and to his dismay, it fared very poorly, because um, as today and as back then, people weren't returning the books. So... And maybe one of the members who left his own book 
um, chose to take it back to read it or to, quote, bone up on something, he wouldn't bring the book back, so the other members wouldn't have a chance to, to get to that book. So um, returning of the books became a very difficult issue. It was just done on the, uh, you know, the volunteer basis, unfortunately. So. I see. Well, I, one of the questions, why did the Gento Library fail? And I see you touched on that. And what was the result of its new form, Rising from the Ashes? I think, I think it was a real kick in the pants to Franklin. He was very frustrated. He, he felt this was a great idea. Um, and in the whole liking, he felt there was a need for non-governmental volunteer associations. So this led Franklin to, to feel we need, we need to be, have sustainability in this, um, this book club, so to speak, or this library that we're pursuing. So what he did was he, uh, he garnered or he made a subscription. Any, anyone who wanted to join any of these craftsmen beyond the junto, you had to be a working class craftsman, and there were hundreds. They had to put up two shillings, or two, I'm sorry, two pounds. It was equivalent of two, uh, two, one and a half, two weeks of the wages of a craftsman, and it was a lot of money to them. Um, but it was phenomenally accepted, and you had a whole a plethora of people that joined up. And uh, it worked very well. Uh, this went on for a couple years. And there would be some penalties built into this. Now, if, if you didn't return the books on time, um, a borrower uh, owning a subscription could take two, three, four books out, but he couldn't supersede the two pounds that he put down in lieu of. And uh, if he brought it late, there was fees, a fee chart set up. He would have to, the money would be taken out of the subscription deposit, and he would not get the money back. Then he would have to recharge his subscription to get it up to the two pounds that he could again come back and take books out. If, in fact, he never brought the book back, he shows up, he loses the book, he loses the whole week's wages or whole subscription wages, unfortunately, for him. So this, this played part and parcel that it's good to do what you're supposed to do. You take somebody else's merchandise, property out, you return it. Um, and it became rather successful. In about two years of working the bugs out of this, again, you know, hashing around the, the city tavern and some houses, they actually got a location more down toward where the Franklin Institute is today. And uh, that became the, the library of the Philadelphia Library Company as it is known today. But two years later, they opened this up to the public. So this was going to be the first um, community library that would turn into a lending library with subscriptions in the world. The first in the world occurred part and parcel to the, the Junto and Franklin. And uh, so two years later, you would come in, and if you took a book out, you would have to put a deposit from a public individual, the value of two times the book. You'd leave the deposit at the front of the desk, you take the book, when you brought the book back, you got your deposit back, and it became very, very successful. Interesting. Now, how old and why do you think the Philadelphia Library Company is still standing today? Well, it's still standing because I think they, they, they've stood by their steadfast rules. Um, this would have been the first late fees developed by any library as far as we know in the world. So because they stood, they stood by, you must return your books, the merchandise. Uh, I think they only last, lost a half a percent of all the books in 283 years. So just phenomenal. Um, but one thing uh, could have put a wrench in that, the British, when the British occupied Philadelphia in 1777, um, the books were moved on the second floor of Carpenter's Hall and not totally hidden, but they were put up there quite anonymously that, uh, you know, the British weren't really interested in looking for books and uh, the, the colonists were quite worried about the British occupation. So people weren't going up and down the stairs of Carpenter Hall to retrieve books. So they stayed safe there until after the revolution. Interesting. And how long did these not-for-profit libraries exist? The, uh, the not-for-profit, not uh, non-governmental associations such as this library uh, existed the same way until about 1845, and then the first governmental library came in. So then you started having cities putting money into the budget to produce libraries, lending libraries, subscription libraries for the general public. So you had a great run from 17, probably 1740s, early 1740s to 1845, of these non-governmental libraries working. But in the same token, uh, 
they spawned other civic associations, which Franklin is, is famous for, you know, the University of Pennsylvania, and, and the fire company, just to name a few. Again, these were non-governmental based, and that's the important thing here. People helped in the colonies create their own government, their own civic organizations. And why was the library termed the library company? I think that was probably taken from uh, many, many years, probably back into the mid, mid to third quarter of the 17th century from France. Uh, over there, the, some of the first guilds popped up in, uh, in the world of furniture uh, or actually in clocks in England, the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers. So the word company means back in Old English or actually in the French lexicon, it means a guild, uh, a not-for-profit association. And uh, so again, before the government got involved in these things. And what kind of books or holdings did uh, Franklin's Library Company contain? From the beginning, it was uh, self-help books, how-to-do books, uh, no novels, no fantasy, no fiction, none of the sort. It was strictly nuts and bolts, how to better yourself, how to better your position, how to better your art, your craft, and your field, how to relate to people, um, these kind of books. And they were hungry for them because they needed them. And uh, it was a smashing success. There were, there were people... Uh, exponentially waiting to get into the Junto after this thing uh, took off. And um, we know Franklin was a printer, but where did uh, the books come from that filled the library? Well, Franklin was uh, ingenious, he, uh, industrious, and he, not only being a printer, but he had all his printer ties, his ties of a printer back in England and France and all up and down the East Coast. So he was well connected and he started importing books. Um, so all the books came from our mother imperial country, the UK, and that's where Franklin, um, Franklin, frankly, he, uh, he vetted them all and he brought them in, he purchased them. So um, Franklin being an industrious, he was making money off this to an extent, but you know, perhaps that was well founded for what he did for us. So he was, uh, he was an importer, he was buying books. And when Franklin retired, I think it was in the 18, 1770s, he retired as, his part in the Philadelphia Library Company, um, he had a run of 200 years in Philadelphia, making Philadelphia the most educated and possibly the most cosmopolitan uh, city in the world behind Paris and London. So because of Franklin solely, he educated so many people with his library and the importation of books. So what a great thing he did. And lastly, what is the mission of the library today and how does it function, and to whom? Uh, today, today the library is a research library. Hardcore um, research materials from the beginning of our nation. The same books are sitting there. Uh, you can go there. People that go there want to do research of, of history, of how the Junto started. Also, they want to understand the culture of books and the culture of library. So when you go to the library, they're going to, someone with light, white gloves is going to get the book, bring the book out, put it on the desk, and chances are you may be asked if you need to touch it, you're going to put gloves on to open the book up in front of you. So no books are relieved from the library. It's strictly a research library. And uh, in the, during the Continental Congress, the library turned into one of the best places to educate our, uh, our politicians, our, our House and the, the Congress. So it was called the Library of the Congress, it was dubbed in the 1770s. And it was free to them, they did not have to pay to, to take a book out at that time. And sometimes it's still referred to the Library of Congress, the Philadelphia Library Company. Interesting. Thank you so much for your time today, Greg. And we appreciate all of the information. And thanks for stopping by the uh, Shivers Conservation Library.